This is your video for Keeping It Fresh Chapter 7. On number one, write the product as a power. Remember, a power is both a base and the exponent. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Your base is your repeated factor, so my base is 2. My exponent is how many times I multiply that factor by itself. So 2 to the fourth would be 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. For number 2, that would be 15 to the third. Find the value of the power is when we want you to tell us, well, what does that equal? 4 to the third would be like 4 times 4 times 4. So 4 times 4 is 16, and 16 times 4 is 64. So that's your answer there. 8 to the second power, or 8 squared, would mean 8 times itself, 2 times. And 8 times 8 is 64. Uh, the next two problems would be utilizing order of operations. What we want to do here first in number 5 would be parentheses. So we're going to have 5 squared minus 20 plus 3, and then 24 minus 18 is 6. Now I have that exponent, subtraction, addition, and multiplication, so exponents would come next. 5 to the second, remember we just talked about up here, means 5 times itself twice, so that's 25. Next would come multiplication, because a number next to parentheses means multiply. So 3 times 6 is 18. And then it's adding and subtracting whatever comes first from left to right. So I'm going to add 20, or no, sorry, not add. I'm going to subtract 25 and 20 first. So 25 minus 20 is 5. So I'll line that there. And then 5 plus 18 is 23. Uh, over here, we have 12 divided by 6 times 2. So again, the from left to right is the really important part here. Even though normally in our saying multiplying comes first, it's whatever comes first between multiplying and dividing from left to right. So we're going to divide 12 divided by 6 first, and then do 2 times 2 to get 4. Uh, factors of 12. This is really just kind of testing your guys' knowledge of these vocab words. What's a factor and what's a multiply? Factor are numbers that you can divide into 12. They're numbers that together would multiply to equal 12. So you're thinking of numbers I can divide into 12, four of them. I'm going to list all the possibilities because you might have picked different ones than me. So there are six factors of 12. You just need any four of those. Multiples of 10. There's, not, there's an unlimited number of multiples of 10. It's like counting by 10. The answers you get when you multiply 10 times 1, 10 times 2, 10 times 3. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, oops, 60, 70, etc. Right? So any number you can get to counting by 10, any number that ends in 0 would be a multiple of 10. On uh, number 8, we've got 5 eighths plus 1 sixth. Now remember, to add fractions, you need a common denominator. You could use... 48. You could do 8 times 6 and just use that as your denominator. Uh, but then you'll have to reduce at the end. So we want to try and use a lowest common denominator, but if we can't think of it, it's always okay to just do 8 times 6 and use that. Uh, your lowest common denominator here, so it's uh, LCM or LCD, would be 24. So I'm going to change both of these to a fraction out of 24. And the way I do that is, okay, I make my new denominator, but I think about, well, how did I get from 8 to 24? What did I multiply by? I multiplied by 3. So I have to do the same thing to the top. I have to multiply that top by 3. So 5 times 3 would be 15. Over here, I must have done 6 times 4 to get to 24. So I need to do 1 times 4 to get my new numerator over here. So now I can add. I have 15 24 plus 4 24 that's 19 24ths. Chapter 2, multiplying fractions, dividing fractions, decimals, all that good stuff. Uh, for multiplying, where multiplying is probably the easiest operation when it comes to fractions because you don't need a common denominator and there's not really any special rules to remember. When I multiply it, now this 10, that whole number, I do want to make that a fraction. 10 as a fraction would be 10 over 1. And then remember, there is something I can do with multiplying fractions. I can cross-reduce. So I can look at these two numbers here and these two numbers. 
and ask myself, is there a number I could divide into both? Well, not for 5 and 1, other than 1. But 10 and 12, I can divide those both by 2. So 12 divided by 2 is 6. 10 divided by 2 is 5. And now I can multiply straight across. So 5 times 5 is 25. 6 times 1 is 6. So 25, 6 is an acceptable answer because that is in simplest form. Or you can make it a mixed number. That would be 4 and 1, 6. 10. I've got a mixed number there, that 3 and 3, 4. So I'm going to need to make that an improper fraction. So remember, you do the whole number times the denominator, and then you add the numerator. So 3 times 4 is 12, plus 3 is 15. Your denominator stays the same. Now I can check for cross-reducing. I can actually cross-reduce both ways here. 2 and 4, I can divide those both by 2 to get 1 and 2. 15 and 5, I can divide those both by 5 to get 1 and 3. So then 3 times 1 is 3, and 2 times 1 is 2. 3 halves is a good answer, or you can write it as a mixed number. That'd be 1 and 1 half. What's the reciprocal? Those directions actually only apply to 11 and 12, and then 13 and 14 are dividing problems. Reciprocal, remember, is when we flip the fraction. And the reason we ask you about that 11 and 12 is because you'll need to remember to do that in 13 and 14 when you divide. So the reciprocal is simply taking the numerator and the denominator and switching spots. So the reciprocal, 9 fifths. Probably you shouldn't really put an equal sign there. Uh, but the reciprocal would be 5 ninths. Here, I'm going to want to make that an improper fraction first before I find the reciprocal. So 3 times 5 is 15, plus 1 is 16. So it's 16 fifths as an improper fraction, which means its reciprocal is 5 over 16. Uh, dividing. Remember, dividing the phrase I used, skip times flip. I know in elementary you learned, like, keep it, switch it, flip it, or keep, change, flip. It's all basically are telling you the same thing. We don't ever actually divide fractions. We change it to a multiplication problem. So we multiply by the reciprocal. That's the flip part in all of these. Since flip's at the end of every single saying there, that's because that last number, the one after the division sign, that's the one that gets flipped. The first one, the skip, the skip, the skip or keep, uh, is the one that you keep the same. You do not flip it around. Now, if it's a mixed number, you make it improper, but you don't change the top and bottom. You don't swap them out. So here I've got three eighths, so that's going to be skipped. Division becomes multiplication, and I'm going to flip. One over four is now going to be four over 1. And then I follow my multiplying rules. I could cross-reduce here. So 4 and 8, I could reduce those by 4 and get 1 and 2. And that would give me 3 over 2. Uh, or again, 1 and 1 half. Same answer we had on the last page. Just a different problem. Over here, when you have mixed numbers in division, take an extra step of work to simply change those mixed numbers to improper fractions and then do skip times flip. So right now we're just going to change these to improper. So 8 times 4 is 32, plus 1 is 33. I'm still going to write this as division because I'm not doing any skip times flip yet. 1 times 2 is 2, plus 1 is 3. Now I'll do this step right here. So 33 over 4 is going to stay 33 over 4. Skip times flip. And again, I can do cross-reducing here. I can divide these both by 2 to get 1 and 2, and divide these both by 3 to get 1 and 11. So I get 11 halves, which is fine, or 5 and a half. You buy a taco pizza for $12 and a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos for $4.99. You pay with a $20 bill. How much change will you get back? So part of understanding this problem is understanding what operation you need to do here. So if you buy a pizza for $12 and Doritos for $4.99, that's something you need to add together. So let's start with that. I want to add 12 and $4.99. Now, that's a decimal. So I have to remember when I add decimals that I need to line up the decimals. Well, I don't see a decimal in 12. But remember, if you don't see a decimal, that means it's at the end of the number. And I know, money-wise, I could write $12 like that, 12.00. That's going to help me line up my $4.99 and add. So I'm going to get 9, 9, remember the decimal just comes on down from where you lined it up, 2 plus 4 is 6, so I get 16.99. Well, it didn't ask me how much it cost, it asked me 
how much change will I get back? And it said I paid with a $20 bill. So now what I want to do is take that $20 I had, and again, write it like a decimal, and subtract away the $16.99. So if I have, I pay with 20, and I owe $16.99, if I subtract, that's my change. Got a whole lot of borrowing to do here. So I'm gonna make that a one, make this a 10, but then make it a nine. Make this a 10, but then make it a nine, and make that a 10. So 10 minus nine is one, nine minus nine is zero, nine minus six is three. So three dollars and one cent. Don't forget your labels whenever applicable. So that's your answer. Uh, 16 and 17 are decimal operations. So 16 multiplying decimals. Remember the key to multiplying decimals is just pretend like they're a regular old number and worry about the decimals at the end. Uh, multiplying, I can change the order if I want, right? But here it worked out. We like the longer number on top usually. So 7 times 4 is 28. 8 times 4 is 32 plus 2 is 34. 4 times 4 is 16 plus 3 is 19. So let's start a new row here. So I need a 0. And then 7 times 2 is 14. 8 times 2 is 16, plus 1 is 17, and 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1 is 9. Add that all together, and I get those numbers, 1, 1, 6, 8, 8. Where does the decimal go? Well, let's look at our original problem. I had 4.87 and 2.4. So there were 1, 2, 3 numbers that were behind the decimal in my problem. So that means there need to be three numbers behind the decimal in my answer. So you start from the back and go one, two, three. So 11 and 688 thousandths would be our answer there. Number 12, we have 2.6 divided by two hundredths. The first number is your dividend. The second number is your divisor. So this is how you would set it up for long division. Remember, your divisor has to be a whole number. Right now it's not. So I'm going to move the decimal over until it is a whole number. Well, I had to move it two to the right. Whatever I do out here, i got to do in here. We call it move it over, move it over, move it up. So I need to move it over twice as well. Now I've got an empty spot, so I'm going to fill that placeholder with a zero. And then I need to move that decimal up into my quotient. Now you guys know I like to rewrite it after all that business. That's just sloppy. So now two goes into two one time. 2 goes into 6 three times. And then what? We don't just stop. It's not 13. I still have a number left in my dividend. I bring that 0 on down just like I did for all the other numbers that weren't 0. And now I say, okay, well, 2 can't go into 0. It goes in 0 times. So it's 130, not 13. Be careful of that mistake. All right, now we're into Chapter 3 review. Uh, terms, coefficients, and constants of the expression T stands for terms. CO for coefficients, CON for constants. Terms, identify, okay? Not how many, but what are they is what that word identify means. So my terms are 5x, 3y, and 2.1. My coefficients are 5 and 3. Remember, it's just the number in front of the variable, but not the variable included. And constants are numbers by themselves, so 2.1. Over here, my terms are 3x to the second power and w. My coefficients, I have two terms of variables, which means I actually have two coefficients. That 3 in front of the x, and what's in front of that w? A 1. And then constants, I don't have any. There's no numbers by themselves there. Simplify the expression. In this case, that's going to be looking for terms that are alike and adding or subtracting them together. Remember, they're alike if they have the same variable and the same exponent if there's a variable. So 4x squared, there are no other 4x squareds. But here, 3x minus x, those both have x's. Now, we just talked about it. If I see a variable by itself, it's like it has a 1 as a coefficient. So 3x minus 1x would be 2x. And then that 8 has no like term as well. So that would be 4x squared plus 2x plus 8. That's the best you can do. You can't add those together any further. Over here in 21, we can do something called the distributive property. When you have a number right next to parentheses, and that parentheses has an addition or subtraction and the sum or a difference inside there, then you can distribute. It means you take that number on the outside and you multiply it by every term on the inside. So 5 times 2x would be 10x. 
rewrite that plus sign. 5 times 8 would be 40. I'm going to re rewrite this plus sign here. And now I'm going to distribute again. 3 times x would just be 3x. Rewrite the minus sign. 3 times 2y would be 6y. And then rewrite this minus 5. Now I want to look for terms that are alike here. Well, this one has an x, and so does this one. And remember, you want to look for the operation sign in front of it. And then I see some constants that are alike. I've got a 40 and a minus 5. So 10x plus 3x would be 13x. 40 minus 5 would be 35. And then that 6y has no like term, so that's just going to stay minus 6y. So that would be your answer here, 13x plus 35 minus 6y. Find the area of a fairway on the golf course between the two streams. These are the two streams. Okay. Now that's a composite shape. That's not a shape we know the area of. So we're going to need to split that up into two shapes that we do know the area of. In my opinion, the best way to split it is here. I've just made a parallelogram right here. And what shape have I made here? It has one set of parallel sides here and here, and that's it. That's a trapezoid. Okay? So my parallelogram, I'm just going to abbreviate it P over here. Remember, the area formula for a parallelogram is base times height. But remember, your height has to make a 90 degree angle with your base. Uh, you know what, actually? I don't think we can split it this way now that I'm thinking about it because of what I just said. Your base and your height have to make a 90 degree angle. And I'm not going to be able to figure out what that straight up and down height is here. Actually, I could. I take that back. I'm just making things up on the fly here. Let's try that again. I could figure that out because my height would be right here. If I know that this whole distance is 70, then, and this part is 40, then from here to here should be 30, right? And my base would be 40. So let's try again. This is Gillespie's having a brain fart. So base times height would be 30 times 40. So that'd be 1,200. And then I've got my trapezoid. Now remember, the bases are the ones that are parallel. So the 40 and the 70 are my bases. Now remember, the trapezoid area formula is base 1 plus base 2 times the height divided by 2. So 70 plus 40 times my height would be, again, has to make a 90 degree angle at the base, so that would be this 40 right here. And then divide by 2. 70 plus 40, just time sign, is 110. 110 times 40 is 4,400. Oops, yeah, there we go. Divided by 2. And that divided by 2 would be 2,200. So this came out as 2,200. This came out as 1,200. Remember, to get composite area, you need to add your areas together. So I want to do 2,200 plus 1,200. That's 3,400. And don't forget our units. That would be yards squared. All right, 23. The points in the coordinate plane are three vertices of a rectangle. What's the fourth vertex? What's the area of the rectangle? There's two questions here, so make sure you answer them both. What's the fourth vertex? And then what's the area? Uh, remember, vertices are like corners of your geometric shape. Vertex is just the singular version of that word. So they told us it makes a rectangle. And I know rectangles, their feature is that they have two sets of congruent sides. So that means the side across in this one has to be the same length. And the side over here has to be the same length. So that's how I'd connect it to make my rectangle, which means this is my missing vertex. Remember, in ordered pairs, it goes x and then y. And you can see right here, there's the x, there's the y. So over on the x-axis, I have to go over to 7. And then I go up on the y-axis until I'm at 6. 
So the missing vertex is 7 comma 6. What's the area? Well, the rectangle area is base times height. My base would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 squares long. My height would be 1, 2, 3 squares long. So my area would be 5 times 3, or 15. Remember when it's on a grid like that, we just say the word units squared. That would be my area. All right, chapter 7. I'll write the word sentence as an equation, then solve. So again, really looking for two things here. You need to write the equation and solve it, so make sure that you do both. Less than, 9 less than a number, b equals 2. Remember, less than means subtraction, but it also means it switches the order from the way you see it in the sentence. So it's not 9 minus b, it's b minus 9 equals 2. If we solve that over here, that means I would add 9 to both sides to get b equals 11. So I want to see both these things when I'm grading your kit, your equation and your solution, with work shown, of course. Uh, 25, the product of a number g and 5 is 30. Product means multiplication, so we're multiplying 5 and g. You could have also written g times 5 with a time sign, but I decided to write it this way. Now, that's your equation I'd be looking for, or something equivalent to it. To solve, that means you divide both sides by 5, and you get g equals 6. 26, the number k increased by 10 is the same as 24. Increased by means addition, so k plus 10 equals 24. Again, with adding, there's a few other ways you guys could write this equation. That would still be correct. If we solve this one, we'll need to subtract 10 from both sides to solve. So that would give us k equals 14. And 27, the quotient of a number q and 4 is 12. Quotient means division. So q divided by 4 equals 12 is my equation. To solve that, we need to multiply both sides by 4. So that would give us q equals 48. Uh, you and four friends buy tickets to a college football game. The total cost is $70, right? And solve an equation to find the cost of each ticket. So again, multi-part problem. You have to write an equation and solve it, so make sure that you do both. Don't just give me the answer and don't just give me the equation. It says you and your four friends. So total there are five people. Each person's paying the same amount of money for their ticket, and the total cost is $70. What's the cost of each ticket? I'm gonna cost, call the cost of a ticket X, because that's the thing I don't know. Remember, that's what you start with. What's happening to X? Well, I'm getting five X's, right? Five times X should equal 70, so that's your equation. To solve that, divide by 5, so your answer would be x equals $14 for each ticket. So you need both those answers on your keeping it fresh. All right, and our last few problems here. Oh, no, they're not. There's the last few on this page. Uh, tell where the ordered pair is a solution of the equation. So you've got the equation y equals x plus 7. Semicolon tells me the equation stops. And then here's my ordered pair. Just like we talked about on a previous page here, in ordered pairs, x comes first and then y. So I'm going to put 1 in where the x is and 6 in where the y is. So I'm going to have 6 equals 1 plus 7. And what I'm asking myself is, is that true? Well, when I simplify, no, it's not. 6 does not equal 8. So my answer here would be no. Over here, I've got 2 and 0 for x and y. So I'm going to put in 0 for y, 2 for x. So I get 7, plus, or 7 times 2 is 14. 14 plus 2 is 16. 16 does not equal 0, so that's a no. And over here, 4 and 5. Uh, mixed up the order of the equation a little bit there, so pay careful attention. The x actually comes first here, so 2 times 4 minus 3 equals 5. Is that true? Well, 2 times 4 is 8, and 8 minus 3 is indeed 5. So here our answer is yes, that is a solution of the equation. Now we're on our last two problems. Write the word sentence as an inequality, solve, then graph. Lots of things you got to do. Write the inequality, solve the inequality, graph the inequality. So I'm looking for three different things there when you do this, Kip. So a number w minus 3 is less than 10. That's your inequality. 1. Step 2, I need to solve it. So I need to add 3 to both sides. So that would be w is less than 13. That's the second thing I'll be looking for. The third thing would be your graph. 
So put your number on there and I have at least one number on either side of it. Decide what dot you want. Less than would mean an open dot. W less than 13 means the numbers less than 13 are solutions, so that's where I want to shape. So your graph should look like that. 33, and number Z divided by 2 is at least 6. So Z divided by 2. This one's a tricky one. If it's at least 6, that means the smallest it can be in 6. So it's actually greater than or equal to 6. So that's your equation, or, or sorry, an equality we're looking for. Uh, to solve, you'd multiply both sides by 2. That would give you Z is greater than or equal to 12. That's your solution. And then your graph. So we'll have 12, 13, 11. We want a closed dot on 12 because it has the line underneath. And we want Z to be greater than 12. All right, that is your video. Make sure you check your kit before you turn it in.